Hi, it's great to see everyone. I know it's um, kind of a hangover kind of Friday um, in the weather last night. Um, I'm Kathy Blackwell, as you said, I'm an executive editor with Texas Monthly here in Austin, and so I'd like to apologize for the weather. Not sure where that came from. Hopefully it'll get better soon. Came I'm really excited to be here. We brought it with us. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here, and um, this show, there's nothing else like it on television. It really is phenomenal. So I, you guys are really lucky. Um, you definitely should go tonight. So let's let's get to it. Um, I'm sitting next to two amazing multi-hyphenates from Oakland, California. We'll start with Rafael Casal. Yes. <laughs> Poet, writer. Um, he is the uh, executive producer and the co-creator and the writer and the showrunner and a star, he plays Miles on Blind Spotting, the movie and the television show. All with um, separate title cards. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, my glasses. And um, another multi-hyphenate, uh, Grammy and Tony Award winning Davi Diggs, who is also uh, the co-creator and executive producer and writer of Blind Spotting. But his, uh, yeah. And his character um, in the movie Colin is actually not in the show. Um, but he is still very much part of the show, so I'm excited to talk to both of them. Now, you guys are longtime friends. How old were you when you met? Uh, I was, I think I was 18 and you were 14, is that right? Yes, I was a freshman, you were a senior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. School. We didn't talk back then. Okay. It was met. I can't be talking to no freshman. <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe a 14 year old Raphael? <laughs> Kind of just like this, but with longer hair. <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, I do remember like seeing a, a very young Rafa at. Uh, we were all part of the the poetry scene, you know, yeah. and he would end up sort of developing this style that would be like mimicked a lot in that in that scene. And so, like, um, but he, yeah, I mean, he was just like kind of goony, you know. He was like just like like just kind of like a gooned up dude. Uh, but who like would you know? And this was true for a lot of us who who started out like writing. Like that was kind of the freest space. That was like the safe space for self expression. So while all of us teenagers are like struggling with what it means to be masculine, right? Like, okay. like you could get up on stage and be like a, a little bit slightly vulnerable as long as you like worded it in a way that was really impressive. Right. Um, and he was kind of the best at that. Amazing. And what about David? What was he like at eighteen? Uh, well, you know, Jace was big into the theater scene, which I didn't really, I, I wasn't as tapped into. That was like the overlap with, with poetry and music was, yeah. there was also this bracket of theater. We, we went to a, like a very massively large high school, but there was a good arts program throughout at the time, not anymore. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so Diggs was, Diggs was kind of tapped in with everybody, but the thing that was most distinct about Diggs is he wore pajama pants to school. And so you could always clock, like, you know, Diggs was always in like a white tee and pajama pants, and you could spot, you know, kind of plaid pajama pants you could spot from anywhere. He's been styling on people for a very, very long time. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the difference was like, I, I would be very methodical about poetry. I was coming in you know, writing for days, getting ready to, you know, to, to do a performance or to do a reading and Diggs was in the hallway like, I guess I'll do, I guess I'll say this and then he'd get up there and he'd kill it pretty effortlessly. So wow, wow. I had to work harder. <laughs> so just to bring everyone up to speed, the movie came out 2018. I think you brought it here to South by, right? Blind Spotting? Yes. You did, yeah. It was really fun. And you both starred in that. And then um, just kind of walk us through uh why you decided to do it as a television show. It's my understanding that that wasn't part of the plan. Um, and then you started the first, or maybe I'm wrong, so. No, no you're right. no, uh, we, yeah, we had no intention of, you know, it, it's not a great idea to take your indie movie and turn it into a TV show. Um, but I, I think we had, we had really great, um, I mean, our, our Jess and Keith Calder, our, our main collaborators on the show, um, were really encouraging about it. Yeah, give it up for Jess and Keith Calder. What's that? Those are geniuses. Um, and, uh, and, and our, and our folks at Lionsgate in the TV department were like, we really, you know, we'd get behind you guys if you really wanted to do this. And, and we were like, well, it'd have to be a very strange show. Uh, and it'd have to star Jasmine Cephas Jones. So we really felt like, you know, we got a couple days with her on the movie and 
felt that she was brilliant and felt that there was a bigger story there. And I think we told this story about male friendships that we wanted to tell about that kind of a brotherhood. And we were like, well, if we're going to go back to the Bay and do this again, there's a, there's a whole you know, plethora of stories we could be telling. We don't need to continue this one. Let's borrow the world. Let's borrow the, you know, some, of the, some of the people in some of the same circumstances. But let's present it differently. And so this one was, was driven by women was the, was the goal. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's what's so captivating about the show is these strong female characters, really unexpected, really complex. Um, and again, I, I know I said this earlier, but unlike anything else I see on television right now. So I would love to talk about the collaborative process, uh, the right, what the writer's room looks like. Um, and you know, just in, given the fact that you guys have known each other for so long, I'm always curious as to how friends work together. I mean, it's a pretty basic thing, but something that a lot of people have to deal with. So, would love all of that. Yeah, I mean, well, the uh, us working together part has just evolved over a long time. We, you know, we started out making music together, um, which I think is kind of the the crucial element to to everything we do. That space is a is a particular kind of creative space yeah. that I think um, doesn't adhere to some of the the rules that we didn't know anyway when we started working in television. And so, um, yeah, there's uh, we've always been. <laughs> We've always been aware that like you can't really be precious about much. Um, that like the the right idea wherever it comes from is the right idea, and then also that like you can't have expectations on a thing. Our slogan is "Energy up, expectations down." We've been saying that since we were teenagers, and uh, so you put your whole ass into something, and whatever happens is what happens. But you you do it in order to do the thing, and so we sort of approached creating the. Uh, writers room the same way, you know, acknowledging the things that we we know we don't know. So bringing in lots of women to help with that, borrowing stories from our friends, uh, you know, so much, so many touchstones both in the film and in now in the series are people who we know and stories from people who we grew up with. Having the folks who they were based on come into the writers room, zoom in with us. We were writing over Zoom a lot back. Yeah, then. that was so big. Like, I mean, I, th yeah. I think the the general kind of rule was I think with the exception of Ben Turner, who's who plays Earl on the show, who's who's been a co-conspirator for the show, and so he's a big part of the writers' room. All the writers on the show are women. Um, we um, we I think we did a five-person writers' room season one. I think we had a six-person writers' room, six or seven-person writers' room season two. Um, a lot. We're also like bringing in a lot of new people each season to keep that going, and then and then a lot of consultation on the things that we don't know much about. So it's cast or it's people that we're having come in for a day and just give us temples to make sure that we're thinking in the right direction. And um, and 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 that's. I mean, that's it. I mean, you know, the 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 thing that I think has been most beautiful about it is is been trying to allow the show to go where the room kind of agrees that it should. Um, and everyone kicks out ideas, and we try to keep it a, like a yes and room. Um, but you know, the 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 show is really the sum of its parts. Um, so speaking of room and some of its parts, I think a lot of the cast and crew are here. So there's some, yeah, yeah, certainly here tonight. All I think all of them are here tonight. Yeah, I What's see. Up, yeah? yeah, on the front row. We just got off a bus together. Not like we didn't know you were here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and this is the first, obviously, the first show that you've been a showrunner on. Um, did you, um, what was that like? And did you learn things during the first season that you applied to the second season? Literally everything. Everything, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've never done it before. It seems like such um, a huge job. It, it is. It's, um, it sounds, it sounds deceivingly sort of singular. It's not. The, it, all of the executive producers are running the show. All of the department heads are running their departments. All of the writers are responsible for their scripts. I think what me and David and Jess and Keith's jobs are is to sort of be at the center of all of those, all of the machinations of the show, and then be co-conspirators with each other. Um, I think mostly just what my job is within that has just been to kind of be like the person holding the Bible for the show the most so that everyone else can have their individual tasks, you know, and, and we've sort of internally decided who's taking what. That's, a, that's not something that we're like sharing with the crew. It's just kind of like the four of us are running the show. Right. Um, 
yeah, so that I mean that that ex, that experience has been really really rewarding. It's also like we're we, none of us have done television before. Jess and Keith Calder have produced a ton of film, mm -hmm. and so I think more so than anything, David and I are the, on the biggest learning curve in terms of being in terms of being in a leadership position, and so we're learning intensely from them. And then we're also just taking what we know from other mediums of art that we've been a part of for 20 years and applying them to this. And I came up working on crew, so I know a bit about every department because I've worked in a lot of those departments. Um, and so that really helps. Um, and then we have this sort of great overlap because we're also performers and we're also writers. And so we have our, our, our hands in a, a lot of those departments by also doing the work alongside them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's helped a little bit with gaining some trust and credibility with the people that we're working with because we also have to do, you know we don't it's not like we're going to make the show and then we can step back and put it on the cast or put it on everyone else like our faces are out front as well and so we take a lot of the responsibility on just to make sure that everyone knows like hey we're we'll be out front first if this doesn't work <laughs> you know i will i'll th just because there's so many in my time here at south by there's like so many creators here uh, get you a Jess and Keith, really like like the those guys um, on the business side of things. A protect us from a lot, um, which is really really important for for your producers to do uh, because it's already hard enough to make something, and then really like filter down the decisions to the ones we really have to be involved in. And then I'll say this about Raphael as a showrunner too, because he is the showrunner and he's the the best one I've ever worked with, and uh, it's because he. Uh, is really great at setting everybody up for success. So, you know, which is a, has a lot, there's so much you have to do to do that. Create a safe space, acknowledge everybody's ideas, but keep their ideas on the rail. If they're not gonna work for the thing, they can't go in the thing, they will fail. And so like when you see the season, you see the episodes, you see all the crazy art that goes into it, all the, like him being able to create the space for that to exist is a really incredible thing that I, I think he's just kind of better at. I mean, he's my friend, I guess I'm biased, but like I've worked on a lot of shows. This motherfucker is better. <laughs> so season <Yeah>. two. <laughs> <laughs> season two, I've been lucky enough to see some of the show, the episodes you're gonna see tonight. I think they're showing three at the premiere. And um, so I watched those and um, I was really, um, impressed with how, um, and I, I wanted you to kind of talk about what people can expect in this season, but I was impressed with how um, I felt like I could see the show's growth just in those first few episodes. Um, you take more risks. Thank it, God. Feels, it feels funny. It feels even, it, I, of course, it's really, these are. We've doubled the topics. jokes. <laughs> Double the jokes, yeah. That was really intentional <laughs> after really seeing funny. season one. It was like, oh, more more jokes. We can get away with a lot more jokes. Yep. And dancing and music and all of the things. You know, this is uh, right now we're in the music part of South by Southwest. And um, so, of course, I was thinking a lot about your music background and, and how it comes up in the uh, in the show. So let before I jump ahead, which I think I've already done, I'm going <laughs> to go ahead and ask you to talk about what people kind of expect. Because as you saw in the trailer, um, Ashley is um, she got married uh, to Miles at the end of the first season. So you want to kind of take it from there and what people can expect? Yeah, I mean, I think we're just going into the next chapter of what it is to have somebody incarcerated. Is now they're doing their they're doing the hard time. Um, we're nine months in, you know, the first season really just covers about, you know, kind of that first month of what it's like to have somebody taken away and, and the repercussions of that in your life, having to move, changes at your jobs, changes in your family dynamic. And season two is nine months later. It's, we're about to hit the year mark. And, and how is that worn on Ashley? How's that worn on the family? Um, and, uh, and then in terms of the aesthetic of the show, um, I think it's, I think it's bolder in its choices in terms of the conventions. It's not actually more. I think it's just more intentional when we do it. Okay. You know, like season one was like, how is this dance gonna work? How is verse gonna work? Um, and the first few episodes, you know, we, we, we take our risks of figuring out when it should work. I think it really refines itself as the season goes on in season one. And season two, we get to hit the ground running going, all right, we know now, like when are the right moments for this? When does it feel like it's most earned? Um, and that's just allowed us to be a lot more confident and specific in the way that it's, the conventions are used. Um, and so it's, it's, actually a little thinner on those conventions, but when it happens, it's like, it really feels like set, like grounded in its sense of purpose. And that's created so much more space for the show to be what we think is just like a lot funnier of a season because, because we know where that's really, really meant to happen. Absolutely. And how do you balance that, the humor with those serious topics that you were just kind of talking about? Is this just something that you talk about it's a lot in the writer's classic. Room? It's funny until it's not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
You know, that's it's 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 t- it's a two to one ratio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've always thought about that as sort of foundational to telling stories about trauma or just stories about disenfranchised communities in general. Like, we don't not laugh. You know, I mean, and like most of my life has been jokes. So uh, I think it should it should skew about that much. You should mostly remember the jokes and then also be really impressed that you were still able to tell jokes in the midst of the, the trauma happening around you. Good. And um, I'd like to know a little bit about the choreography that goes into those dances. Kind of, Do you have a team that you work with? How does that work? Yeah, John Boogs and Lil Buck are the, the choreographers of this show. I don't know if Boogs is here. He, he's been, he, he'll be here later. Um, but yeah, I mean, two, two of America's great dancers who work a lot in narrative, mm-hmm. actually. And that's kind of why we, we really asked them to come on and, and, and do this for us is because they, both together and separately, have done a lot of storytelling just through uh, dance. And what we kind of learned over the course of the first season was that we could give them almost like very little prompt, actually. We could say like here's what she's thinking and then like they, you know and they would go away with their with all of the incredible dancers who they also like Bugs was was dance captain he was bringing everybody on he was hiring people so he would go and sort of handpick who was going to be right for this moment bring them in rehearse them develop the whole thing and show up on set and do it with almost no time yeah and i think we're we you know the the in-house convention of movement in the show is any time that you feel sort of the arm of the prison industrial complex affecting their lives, um, and it's sort of coming to a, you know coming to fruition or or is, or is becoming an overwhelming thing. That's when dance happens, and so in season one, especially in the early episodes, it was used a little bit interstitially. So we were like, oh, let's do it in sort of the micro moments, and sort of as the season went on, we were like, actually, the micro moments are like we don't even need to punctuate those. The, the, those, it sort of plays out in the dialogue, it plays out in the moments. And so when we got even more intentional about, let's just do it when it really becomes overwhelming. When it's, when it's so pervasive in Ashley's life, that's when, we're, when, when words start to fail, when rationality starts to fail. Like movement starts to be the way that your brain moves when you're trying to, to sort out or give organization to something that's really overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And so them taking that into season two um, and and focusing really on some of the hardest conversations that need to be had, or conversations that can't be had because they're being supervised all the time, or there's the divide of mother and child, or there's the divide of like in law, and you know, like there's a there, all these relationships that sometimes are a struggle for words. Those are the moments when I think they've really you know taken the show to the next level with movement. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so um, you know, we, we've been talking about the um, the issues for this for the season, and of course, we left Earl um, in a in a really bad state in the last the last uh, season, and, and his storyline is is really compelling, um, and um, and I, I guess it ties in a lot with what you're, the work you're doing outside of the show, uh, which is the last Prisoner Project. Um, so I thought we could maybe watch a little bit about this this group and then kind of talk about your involvement and why it's important to you. Sure. Yeah. Let's, yeah, do, let's it. do that. to life in prison for non-violent marijuana charges back in 2014. Corbin Cooper now, free, at home, finally able to hug his daughters. I love Last Prison Project. It's just too amazing. It's a feeling that you, it's better than the lottery. We've all been recipients of Mm -hmm. what that cash flow looks like. My daughter's tuition was paid upon my release. Like, the funds are being used. I 
gonna let you know I'm happy. So talk about your involvement with the group and, and why it's important to you to, to share these stories. Yeah, I mean, all, all our involvement really is is that we want people to know about it. Like, this organization has existed for a while. They do incredible work. We really just found them through um, uh, uh, S Samantha's here, one of our impact producers uh, for David and I. And what we asked them to do, we tried to do this with season one, but like we were just new in television and didn't have any time. <laughs> And the show came out so fast. Yeah. But I remember we, we had talked a lot about, look, when we're, when we're going out and doing all this press stuff, we just don't really want to talk about just the show. Um, but there's a lot of people that are doing the work on the ground, and I'd seen The Last Prisoner Project before. There's a few other organizations that we've, that we've talked to who are doing sort of the grassroots work. We just wanted to make sure that when we're having these press moments that we're like, oh, you know, this isn't, you know, this isn't disconnected from, <laughs> from people who are actually trying to change some of the things that are coming up in the show. And it's also a lot of the, these websites and these people doing this work is where we're getting our statistics from. I remember like, you know, it was last Prisoner Project uh, that during season one, when we were telling people that, um, that Miles was gonna get sent away for X amount of years, and people were like, that seems like a long time for him to get sent away for drugs. It was like, oh, so here's some statistics right. <laughs> of the kinds of sentences that people are getting. And I think it's so mind-blowing for people when they start to actually hear that people are getting 10, 20 year sentences for, for not, distrib not distribution, we're talking about for like a dime bag, for a 20 sack, for things that people have on them right now. You know, um, and so I, I think for us, all we're really trying to do is is just drive attention to them. As you can see, like they're a nonprofit. Like donations really matter. They're they're wildly important. We're obviously not the professionals that are doing that work. Like our job as artists is really to humanize and and demystify what's happening and make it relatable. And then it's then it's this moment of going like, hey, you're like you see the things on the show and you're mad about what happened to Earl. You can like help right. <laughs> you know it'd be wildly helpful if you got in touch with the last prisoner project and try to get people who are who've, who've been incarcerated for can cannabis out of prison yeah yeah david anything else? yeah i mean uh th there are so many so so much of what we're trying to do in this show is just talk about the real life situations of people who are close to us and like it, it, every everybody in here is probably one to two degrees separated from someone incarcerated, right? I would, I would imagine, right? Everybody in here today. I mean, and and this also uh, disproportionately affects women, right? So, uh, one in four women have a family member or loved one incarcerated. One in two black women, um, and so this is also a, it's a race issue and a gender issue as well, um, which is another reason the show's focus is on what's happening to the families outside. Uh, when somebody is pulled away, what it means to move that resource away from a community. Um, and so there are other, we, you know, that's from the SE project, right? Uh, so that's where I get that statistic from, who and they specifically are doing work uh, with family members and with women who are outside, who have loved ones locked up. Um, and so that's another project you can get involved in. And again, like real people on the ground doing this real work that is very, very important. Um, and so our, our stories in here are drawn from real life situations. We get to watch it and empathize with people, hopefully on a large scale who we wouldn't normally empathize with, or we get to see ourselves reflected in them some way. There's a, a, a profitable narrative built up about incarceration in this country, right? Be, uh, that like, we, we assume one of the reasons it was so unbelievable that someone would, only, would get that much for drugs is because we assume people with long sentences are there for violent crimes. That's not true. That's not true. And so when you start to ask yourself, why would somebody be locked up for this long? What, what is the real function of the prison system in this country? Like we were talking about this earlier. So many of the goods that are made in America are made in prisons, right? This is, this is also an economic issue. And so this thing is so holistic, right? There's so much going on here. There's so many ways to attack this and to look at this. Um, and it really, 
you know, the amount of people incarcerated in this country is insane. And it would behoove us all to sort of examine that through an economic lens, through a race lens, through a gender lens. Um, and we will, I think once you start doing that, you realize how actually deeply connected you are to that system and how much it is affecting and hurting your life. Um, the family visitation is part of this this new season. Um, so what kind of research did y'all do um, to kind of figure out, because it, it just, plot-wise, it just sounds really fascinating, kind of like what the situations can, can be like. Yeah, I mean, you know, our focus is on San Quentin Prison in, in, in Northern California. Um, they have one of the few sort of weekend visitation programs that exist in the country. Um, and so a, a lot of our research was specifically about how that institution does it, but of course we pulled also from a few other institutions that, that have similar programs. Um, and the, the value of the program is to try to keep, to try to keep inmates, uh, it, it, you know, having a good family dynamic with their partners and loved ones and their children, to try to lower the recidivism rate, to try to keep them connected to something outside of the prison. And so um, they have these, um, these cabins that you know, families can come into the prison and stay for the weekend, and they can cook and have some you know semblance of normalcy um, while they're serving their their sentence. Um, it is a fascinating, complicated kind of program. It is empathy in a place that feels cruel, um, it, you know, and it's by its very nature. And so, we wanted to explore what it's like to bring a child into that situation, what it's like to try to maintain intimacy and love in these very brief moments of physical contact, what it's like to parent um, in that in that context. And then what it was, you know, really important for us was not only to sort of learn about it and, and, uh, and do all of our research, but we made it a point to shoot at the prison so we could physically be in that space and, ha you know, it's one thing to, to build a set, and we did that as well for some of our, sh you know, some of the shots that we needed. But we it was we were really really adamant that we wanted to go into San Quentin and see that facility and design it to look just like that and have the same, you know, kind of color scheme and space and and that really I think helped our cast find, you know, f you know have have an honest reaction to what it's like to be in that space. And you know, we worked really tirelessly with that with the staff at the prison to know all right, what are the things that are allowed, what are not allowed, what are things that come up with people. We, you know, we did a lot of obviously research online and talked to people who've been in that in that system. And and you know, the thing is, you sit down and you write all the things that you think were going to come up, and then you talk to folks and like they have completely different concerns which is always a, a fascinating thing. So again, that's sort of our policy of like, you just got to react to the truth. Um, and so, yeah, this, this season is about them trying to maintain intimacy and, and a parenting relationship when, when one parent is doing the majority of the, of the work um, and Miles is struggling to, to maintain a connection with his son and with his wife. The visitation episode, Jess Wu directed that one. It's showing here. Uh, also, and so, yeah, it's it's very good. She killed it. It's her directorial, directorial de debut. debut. <laughs> Jess Wu Calder. And she loves talking about it, so after this, ask her a ton of questions. Yes. Go over there. Talk to Jess. She's really talkative. She's Real like chatting. Such a, yeah, bring Not her Not shy at all. <laughs> Um, so let's talk then about about the cast. Um, Jasmine Cephas Jones is incredible as Ashley, and um, she has a musical background. Uh, did y'all meet on, at Hamilton? We met in Hamilton. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. And um, did I mention that he won a Tony for? Hamilton? <laughs> <laughs> so and, did she. And so did she, <laughs> and a Grammy. And um, so uh, most of your cast, they do have musical backgrounds. So I'd like to talk about her a little bit and kind of um, the strengths that she brings to this and how you have been able to play them up in, in the scripts and, um, and then maybe talk about a few others as well. Yeah, well, I mean, Jasmine's the best, uh, you know. Whatever. That's Jasmine Stevens Jones. It's like whatever. She's won an Emmy. She's like, whatever. Oh, yeah, you don't need an Emmy too. Yeah. Uh, no. Jasmine's um, incredible. We we like uh, essentially conceived of a show without telling her, and then we're like, by the way, this character you played for two days, like we're putting the whole show on your back. Is that cool? And she was like, what? I get. Yeah. And then we started shooting it. So, um, yeah, she's incredible, and. Um, 
we used we were able to like flex a, a few more of her time. I mean, part of the fun of writing for Jasmine is just that like she can do anything. So you just keep being like, what about this? <laughs> and she does it. Um, but we have some incredible. I mean, a lot of folks on this show are really close to us. Ben Turner, we've known for a very, very long time. Um, and we knew he wanted we wanted him to play Earl from Jump. We also he came up through the spoken word scene. So we knew him from that. Um, we also knew we wanted him to help us write this. So, you know. Uh, Did he direct as well? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> uh, but Ben Ben writes on the show. I, you know, and, and he kind of goes above and beyond in terms of writing because he's he because we're also longtime close like close friends and collaborators. He's sort of a part of the early early process of conceptualizing the show, and then also um, he and I write the. There, there's these kind of great verse moments with Earl throughout, and we write those together. And he's an MC as well as a poet, and and has so it's contributed to like the aesthetic, the 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 verse aesthetic of the show overall. Um, and and even though not everyone sort of does ver verse on the show, everyone's sort of musicality plays into the way that they all interface with each other. I think because they're all musicians, they handle dialogue in a particular way. Like while um, uh, Candace doesn't do poetry on the show, she is a poet in her own right. And I do think that that plays into the way that she performs Janelle. Yeah. Um, and I think I think her and um, her and uh, Ashley's relationship on the show does feel particularly musical because they both have that background. Um, yeah, we, we fell in love with her on her tapes because of like that before I really knew that she was a poet, I think, because of like the way that, that those cadences influenced the way she spoke, but felt so real to the kind of people we were talking about. Um, and also we knew she could handle text and we were going to write a, a lot of like wordy shit. So yeah. like, she, and, and Jalen talks a lot of shit, which is like has a cadence to it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jalen's an expert shit talker in real life. <laughs> and so we were able to translate that to the show. Um, uh, Atticus is here. I want to shout out Atticus, uh, who plays Sean. Young Addy. Um, his growth over the two seasons is like staggering. I don't know. You know, you work with kid actors. They're just like, what? Well, you never know what you're gonna get. You know, but it didn't matter. he's so gorgeous, right? It kind of doesn't matter. He didn't have to also be good, but turns out, <laughs> um, turns out, not only is he really good, but he's worked so hard. Um, and particularly over the course of season two, like watching him putting in work, working with a coach, running the lines and going from uh, a young actor who was incredibly gifted, who was kind of mimicking the ways that we were asking him to perform mm -hmm. to an actor with with ideas, with input into the scene with I think I should say it like this. I'm feeling like this right now. This scene makes me feel like this um, has been really incredible to watch. His, his journey as a young actor is phenomenal. So uh, you're welcome, industry. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be around for a long time. <laughs> And Jalen's character is is incredibly fascinating to me. Um, I feel Secret like I've sauce. learned a lot watching her. Um, just you know, it's not often that you see um, you know sex workers portrayed realistically and in the way they should be, which is you know they're 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 people, and uh, it just it just it's very humanistic. And um, what kind of research? What kind of consultation? Consultation. So they came into yeah. the room and. Um, it, but there was folks coming into the room. There's a few people that I grew up with who have been in that industry or are still in that industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I think also it was really important to us that, like, it was going to be a facet of the show. And we wanted to make sure that it didn't become sort of the driving force of the show because I think at that point we're no longer qualified to, be, to, to, to do that show. Right. I think we can, as a, as, a, as a B plot of the show, to go, all right, we'd like to display this world the way that we saw it, um, how do we make sure that the things that are happening in that world are, mo are most important? And one of the things that, that one of the folks that came into the room said, when we asked, like, you know, obviously, I'm sure you've watched a lot of TV and film portrayals of the work that you've done in your life or the way that you've lived your life. Is there, what have you not seen that has been frustrated that isn't played up? And the thing that was said, oh, you know, over and over again to us from different people was, those are some of my closest friends that I'm around and we support each other. And the portrayals of us as like catty and competitive is bullshit and not how, th these, are the, these are the women that help me survive. Um, men are the problem, <laughs> you know, it's a, more, more of that. And so 
Um, and so it was really important for us to have, to, to have Trish have really strong friendships. And so I think what started in the beginning of the first uh, season in the first episode where we sort of introduce a couple of her friends to keep bringing them back, yeah. even just to go like, these, this is a consistent group of women that really support each other. Um, and so that was really um, that was really key. And then the other thing that that I think we really latched onto was this idea of the entrepreneurial spirit. Right. And so season two really is about at the end of season one, Trish, has, Trish and Jackie say that they're going to start a business, and we skip forward nine months, and it's doing great. Yeah. So much so that like the season isn't about like, oh my God, how are we going to like now we're business women? How are we going to handle being business women? It's actually just assumed that it's doing fine, and it's all about how their personal lives are as young as young adult women, right. and and what that transition has been like for them. Yeah. Um, and so that that was really really fun to explore, especially because I think in working with Jalen, who I think. Is, is one of the most phenomenal performers I've ever seen. She came in playing Trish, who was going to be this, like, you know, h- like, harder antagonist for, um, for Ashley. And the jokes were going to be sort of circumstantial. And what we learned really quickly is that Jalen is fucking hilarious. So funny. Um, and her ability to improv is, like, off the charts good. And so by the end of the first season... Uh, which was the, the 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 finale was the first episode that I ever got to direct, and I remember this moment where Jalen had to come through a door and deliver a line, um, and it, it wasn't even like a particularly funny line because I think we we were pretty exhausted at that point in terms of our writing, um, and so I just got to like shout from you know from the monitor, try something else, <laughs> just do something else, <laughs> and. Um, and she did like ten takes, and every single one was brilliant. And so I think. We're just, you know, we're just like falling out laughing at the monitor. And so a lot of this season was just set up for Jalen to just do what she does. Um, Because I think for all the funny situations that we can write, she's funnier. (laughs) Um, And so to have somebody who can be that hilarious and then also have the dramatic chops Mm -hmm. just makes her like a sensational actor to watch um, as a fan. And how did you get Helen Hunt involved? Oh, Twitter. Yeah. Twitter. Twitter. You? Yeah. yeah right. uh, she tweeted that she liked the movie, and I wasn't going to let that slide. I was like, what's up? <laughs> um, Want to be my mom? <laughs> um, uh, no, it, but it, it, it kind of was like that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we, you know, she, she, we got on each other's DMs, and I think this other great thing happens when you, you know, I didn't think that it would happen in, on this level of the industry, but certainly this happens when you're, when you're touring as an artist or a poet or as a musician, you tap in with people. And if you're a musician, you're like, let's get in the studio, which is really like, let's just get in the workshop mode together and see what happens. Or let's, you know, let's hang out and see what kind of artistic collaboration comes. And she, she offered that up. Um, and I don't think at the time I was as familiar with Helen as a director or as a writer. Um, and so when she was like, I'm writing all the time, I'd love to be around other writers, um, which I thought was just like a really beautiful thing to do to people who, uh, you know, are essential, at least for me, was essentially on to, to her world and unknown. And so I think we started sp- spending, you know, like artistic time together in, in community with her. And, and I joked really early on, I was like, you should tell if we ever do a show of this, you should totally play my mom. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and then when we finally got the show greenlit, she was like, you haven't asked. <laughs> Uh, and we're like, oh. <laughs> um, and then we, you know, we invited her in. We were like, well, do you want to do it? And she was like, well, I have to see a script. <laughs> and, and, you know, we proposed our version of it. And, and again, because we're not women, women in her age range, we had written a very, like, two-dimensional version of our own mothers. Wow. And, um, and she was like, this needs to be a lot better and gave us a bunch of notes and, and, and helped us create a three-dimensional version of Rainy. Yeah. Um, And so it was really fun to sort of invite her into the process as a collaborator. And while she's not credited as a writer on the show, she's absolutely all over that character in terms of how she talks and how she thinks and how she walks through the world. Um, And she also um, hung out with my mom a few times. (laughs) and That helped. She hung out with David's mom, you know. Did a lot of research. (laughs) That is true that we really do um, lean on the actors on this show quite a bit, as I think like most shows do. Um, And so it is... Yeah, a, a lot of actors probably deserve m- more writing credit than they get. But, like, you know, we have this incredibly talented group of people who, like, take 
these characters and infuse them with life and are doing their own research on the side and like coming coming back at us with more ideas than we could possibly hold in our heads. So it really is like um, the the thing I knew very early on that we did right was cast the show correctly. It these yeah they're they're the right people for these parts. Absolutely. Maybe except Miles, but <laughs> well, I, I came in the package. So. He was already <laughs> EP. <laughs> So uh, we have some audience questions. Um, you can still ask on the app and you can upvote, but I'll go ahead and start reading a couple of these. Um, so from Anonymous, how do you deal with writer's block when it comes to writing an episode or writer's block in general? First of all, Anonymous, keep fighting the system. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're glad you're here. Don't hurt us. Um, <laughs> um, uh, look, writer's block is inevitable. Um, it's just what writing is. I it's just what writing it's like is. Only a series of blocks that if, you. Yeah, if you're having a hard time writing, join the fucking cohort. Uh, that's. We that's literally just, just like we were both writing other scripts. We spent most of our South by time locked in an Airbnb together, writing separate things, just so when one of us had writer's block, we could scream at the other one and punch a wall or something, and the other one could be like, "It's okay, man. You're gonna get there. You know. So all right, bounce some ideas off me." Like, <laughs> writing is suffering. You're trying to capture the human experience. Just that small little thing. Uh, it's okay to struggle with that. People struggle with that. They're not fucking writers. It's totally okay. Um, take your time to find to find the language. So it, sometimes people write scripts very quickly and good for them. Uh, <laughs> sometimes people take a decade or sometimes you take, you know, there's a lot of amazing authors that wrote one book in their whole life. Like just find the truth of it, whatever, however long that takes. I also think 95% of the writing process happens here. Right. Execution is the final, final step. A lot of it too, I find myself getting stuck when I think I'm supposed to be doing something, uh, right? When like I think I'm supposed to be writing in a particular way, whereas like that's not a thing actually. However you write is how you write. And the, the more you can trust that and then like just finish a thing and hand it to somebody. Be like, is this, does, what is this to you, you know? And if you thought you were writing a script and they're like, this is a novel, then you say, well, I'll try again. Oh, okay, we have Mari, an Oakland resident. Uh, Oakland and the Bay um, is really a character of the of its own in the show. How do you continue to spotlight the city in season two? Man, we we got off in season two, man. We, I mean, there's a there's a lot of good Bay stuff in there. There's a, the, I mean, they're in the trailer, right? E40 and Two Short are in the are in this series, um, which uh, Mark Curry is in the series. Come on. We got Pilo in there. Uh, we, yeah, I mean, like, uh, so a lot of, be, it, once you have a TV show to point to, it's a lot easier to get people to do the TV show, you know? <laughs> um, so so it was cool to be able to go to some of these folks who we really respect and who we were, as, particularly the musicians for, for me and for us, who we were lacing the, the soundtrack and the score with their stuff anyway. It was great to get some of them in there um, and to, to try and, and use them to just infuse a little more culture in the thing. Um, but yeah, Mark Curry was a, was a huge one for us. I don't know, man. Hang it, because Hanging with Mr. Cooper is the other Oakland sitcom, you know? <laughs> so that, that was amazing that he would agree to do it. Guap Dad, come on, we got, yeah, look, it's bait out. <laughs> Did you do season one during the pandemic? Was that? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, that, so that's why it was a little bit more limited than? Yeah, yeah, that's why. Huh? That, yeah, that yeah. is. Totally, that's it. <laughs> well, you know, and the the machine of Hollywood doesn't particularly like to shoot places where there isn't infrastructure. And so, you know, what we're hoping to do among, you know, a, a cohort of other filmmakers um, you know, Boots Riley just just shot his. Saw, did um, anyone get to see? Um, yeah. I'm a Virgo. I'm a Virgo. Yeah. yeah. Um, we just, you know, we just saw the the premiere of that, and like, you know, we're it's we all kind of know each other. We're texting while we're shooting our shows, and and we're talking about how hard it is sh to shoot in the Bay, and and, how, and what the limitations are, and so we are trying to constantly raise more awareness about what those challenges are so that the city and the, and the county can change some of the policies so that it's easier to shoot there. Because there is this amazing film community in the Bay that want more, you know, and want more things shot there and want more job opportunities. And I think, you know, we have to shoot a lot of it on stages. I think um, uh, I'm a Virgo shot a lot in New Orleans. We shot a lot in LA on stages, but we're all fighting for how many days can we shoot in the Bay? How much can we get out of those days? How much local crew can we hire? How many local businesses can we feature? 
And so, you know, I think every time we've increased it between season one and season two, we were, we increased it maybe I think by like five days or a week or something like that, which is a lot when you increase from, I think we went from two to three weeks. That means, you know, cause every, every episode is five, five days of shooting. So you're adding a day or two per episode that we can go to this park or go to this business or shoot this house or, you know, it, it, or, or shut down downtown and drive our cars through there or hire the crew of dudes who do tricks on their bikes or, you know, nearby or we you know we reopened Lucas Lounge in downtown Oakland which has just gotten shut down and bought by developers and we were like hold on don't fucking shut it down we're about to shoot there because we want to immortalize the things that are disappearing and so for us the the bay became became this this like it's always the light at the end of the tunnel when we're shooting the show we're like oh at the end of this we're going to go home and we're going to get everything for every episode all in one swoop great great and i just realized how silly of a question that was about shooting during the pandemic of course you did i just the time is like what is time yeah, 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 I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> no um, okay, we have another question um, from another anonymous. Uh, how can we all in this room support the last prisoner project, and what is most needed at the moment? Go to the website. Donate, donate, donate. Donate, 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 donate. Um, if you go and you buy weed at a dispensary, you have money. Donate. <laughs> um, we're spending money on cannabis all the time, maybe not in Austin, but in the states where it's legal. Or, you know, you have $10, you have $20. Like, just do it out of fucking guilt that you can do it and not go to prison. Um, that there's people serving unbelievable sentences while you're there smoking on your back porch. Donate in that moment of realization. Um, and then I think also just raising awareness about um, the reality that this is still something that's really affecting a mass mass amount of people um, on, the, on the state and federal level. And so I think just arming yourselves with a couple statistics when somebody's like, you know, they say some sly shit about prisoners, about people who are imprisoned, that you have some way to counter that narrative a bit by humanizing it. I think that's huge, huge, huge. That's great. Do we have, are there, there are folks from other organizations in here today? No. Is there, I think there's someone from SE Reform. Reform is here, Reform right? Reform is here too. Reform is a great organization that you can support that works on sort of the, the, the bail complex that's happening to get people out of prison when they're awaiting trial and also the repercussions after people are let out. Um, SE is, is a Bay Area based organization that's also a national organization um, that's really about, it's, it's founded by um, a women of incarcerated uh, loved ones um, based, in, based or founded in Oakland and they're really about supporting the families of people that are incarcerated um, with e everything from financial help to mental health. Um, so those are, those are sort of the three organizations that we're, that we're most familiar with at the moment. Um, Last Prisoner Project, SE and Reform. Please, please, please check them out. Um, from Lisa Hammer, what were you most excited about blind spotting season two, and what um, have been some unexpected happenings during the process? Uh, we should both answer this. I'll do my hype ones. All right. Uh, one, there's a Western episode, uh, which is uh, which will premiere tomorrow. That was so fun. <laughs> Uh, to like get a Western town and do a full ass Western episode, all from the perspective of Sean. Um, so that's really, really exciting. Um, and then two um, is Jess Wu Calder's directorial debut. Um, she's been a, an amazing um, producer of film for so long, and a, and a, and, a, and someone who develops um, writers like us. Um, and so to see her step into the director's chair for two episodes this season is unbelievably um, fun and exciting to watch. Um, and then we did work with the Henson Company. We did work with the Henson Company. We'll we'll save that surprise. But yeah, that that was a uh, yeah. I think I'm excited. I'm excited for all of the ways that the that the cast got to stretch out this season. Are we? Uh, what episode? Can Nah, we're not showing that one. All right. Well, <laughs> Candace gets to do some truly wild shit <laughs> this season that she busted her ass for. She like worked really hard for. I just like I'm really um, the the places that that the cast have gotten to take these characters make me really happy. And the way some of the the characters who we only got to feature snippets of, we got a little more time with them. Um, so Cuddy's back in a. Uh, yeah. What up, Lance? <laughs> Come on, Lance. Cuddy's back uh, in a more central role, 
add Jackie. Um, April Absent. April Absent. Bigger back. role this season, which is yeah, amazing. yeah, yeah. Um, so the and that, their storyline is is kind of one of my favorites, and they have it one episode that that highly highly features them, and and so yeah, just getting more getting more time with these characters, getting to have them stunt a little more. That's right. Oh, this is a good one. Um, what do you feel is the role of the artist in combating this crime wave pro cop narrative we see in so many cities, especially online? Ooh, it's a little heavy. Yeah. That's good. Um. Well, I think you gotta present alternative narratives. It's uh, all we're doing as artists is presenting narratives, and I think. Um, but there is the yeah, there is a thing that is um, every time, particularly in television, because it moves so fast and you're trying to accomplish so much, and in, in film too. Uh, we are all reducing things, right? You can't, you can't tell, you're picking and choosing parts of the story that you're gonna choose. And oftentimes those choices have to do with, are, are, not, are, are not necessarily, you might not be watching a pro-cop narrative because someone is intentionally trying to promote that narrative, but because it is a story about a police officer and we're focusing the narrative, right? But by doing that and dehumanizing the, the, the people that the police officers are locking up, uh, that, that, perpetuates a certain thing that's been going on in this country and is part of the reason. And it's and also like it is insidious. It is intentional. It is like in order to keep prisons open that don't need to be open. And so like you can you can hide it under the guise of just creating story or you can work really hard to complicate all sides of this issue and make everyone a real person. Um, and tell and then also intentionally tell the stories about people who are are criminals, right? And realize that that's that is a that's not a label that anyone is born with. Um, and that's not, and that is a label that's been put on them by a particular system. So you can choose to examine systems that, in the way that they actually exist in your, in your content. Yeah, I mean, television is a propaganda machine for humanizing police. It has been for a long, long time. I think the CIA, like, very publicly helps. Um, and so, I, you know, by, by being consultants for shows and making sure that, it, you know, there, there's, a, there's a big, there's a, there's a big investment and how police are represented on screen to favor in law enforcement. And there's a lot less shows from the perspective of the people that that impacts. Um, and so I think the role of art is, is always to give the unheard perspective um, and to humanize the people who are being affected by it. What is it, what's that amazing, I can't remember it now, what's that amazing quote about lions and hunters? It's like as long as the hunter is telling it, the, the lion's always the dangerous one. Or something like that, and that it, it does feel as though like we've just had a lot of time hearing it from the hunter's perspective, um, and so I think our, our job as artists is to go, hey, you know, our perspective of of police growing up was tremendous fear and corruption, um, and and that's the narrative we always knew, and then there was this there was this other fantasy cop on TV who was like nice and just and was like looking for the bad guy. And then one day you go, oh, am I the fucking bad guy in this? Like, is that who I'm, is that who the portrayal is? Is people from where we're from or people from this economic background or from this racial background or whatever? And so I think art's job is to be the counter narrative to that. Very good, very good. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so let's, or maybe two. Um, uh, I love the inclusion of the port. Oh, another anonymous. Sorry. I love the inclusion of the port and the longshore. As a proud Oakland native, can you share more of developing that narrative and if it will return in season two? So the port uh, was part of um, Earl's story. Yeah, I wish I wish we got to be at the port even more this season. Um, that unfortunately was just the the job for the end of season one. I think what we were trying to do with that and what we've tried to do the rest of, the, of season two is highlight other places like that that people don't normally associate with the, with, with what industries are about Oakland. Like what we hear about Oakland in the Bay Area is like it's tech, it's tech, it's tech. And that's not true for a lot of the people that grew up there. We're, we're, we exist in a lot of other industries. And so what was really beautiful about that is in engaging with the port, we got to engage with a lot of the people that work at the port and we got to film there and go out under the bridge for the first time, like on a tugboat and things that we like grew up seeing our whole lives, but never thought we'd ever be able to you know, participate in. And so 
season two is just more, it's more of that, but we just have so much to cover. <laughs> you know, we have so many different things we want to show. So season two, there's about four or five other kind of big sort of temple pieces like that that we're like, okay, great. Well, now that we've done that one and shot it as beautifully as we can and, and, and brought it to life as much as we can, let's go around to some of the other sort of lesser known things that people associate with the area yeah. and bring those to life. Okay, good. Good. Um, I actually have a question. Is there any chance Colin might make an appearance at some point? Again, it's, he's in Montana, right? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what we've been telling. We don't Sean, talk about Bruno. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I can neither confirm nor deny uh, <laughs> calling appearances because our funding is based on it. No, uh, <laughs> we just string people along long enough. Come back, watch season three. You really want to see season three if you want to see some Colin, right? Um, no, I don't know. You have to watch. Um, let's see. Um, Nathan Andrews, my mom is a state public defender and has spent most of her career working with kids. How has youth incarceration impacted your stance on the prison system? And I think this will take us out, by the way. On a light note. Um, <laughs> How has locking up children impacted you? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so many friends of ours were... were you know, got into the system very young, friends and family members, and um, and it's really hard to get out. Whatever point you get in, it's really hard to get out. And so, um, starting that journey young is is uh, is is an even more treacherous thing. And it's something that's gonna be sitting with you your whole life. And that that is really sad. And I've watched it actually kill family members of mine. So you know. Um, yeah. So my stance on the prison system is 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 greatly affected by it and um yeah, there are there are there are better ways. There are definitely better things to do than incarcerate children. I don't know that you'd get a lot of disagreement about that when you say it out loud. Um but it's it's what happens when we're not speaking it out loud that is the problem. So just like Very good. Yeah. Well, tonight's exciting. You're going to show the first three episodes of the new season at 5 o'clock at the Paramount. And um, so you should come. It will be amazing. And I think they might show the trailer one more time before we head out, if you missed it the first time. But I want to really thank Rafael Casal and Debbie Diggs for being here today and for, and for the whole cast and crew for being here, too. Thank you.